Lads! Welcome back to Fusion YGO. Look, there's drama going on in the Yu-Gi-Oh! community as a whole, and I thought it would be beneficial if I provided a resource. But, in order to provide that resource and to address this drama properly, I think it's important to preface this. I'm gonna start this video off with a disclaimer. I am in no way, shape, or form a financial expert. Nothing that I am suggesting is what I'm saying you have to do. It is simply the things that I have done to allow me to get what I want and to be able to play this game at a high competitive level that I enjoy. This works for all levels of competitive gameplay. This video is meant as a resource that, that will give you access to the same information and all of the things and tools that I use to benefit you and to allow you the same opportunities that I have been able to be afforded due to my planning and preparation and my use of these resources. This video is going to be broken into multiple parts. First, the things I think Konami can do to maximize profits while also increasing the accessibility to the game that we all love. Second, there are the resources that I have used to be able to build my collection. And third, are the practices that I have used along with my team to maintain a healthy and sustainable model that we have used for now three full years and have spent zero dollars on this game. I have not spent a personal penny on this game in three years, which is mind blowing. And I'm gonna show you how I've done it so that you can take it and use this as a resource to build your own collection in the same way. Additionally, this model does require you to make some form of initial investment. I recommend you looking at what you can afford and as you'll see, depending on your current collection size, may not require a large amount of financing. With all that goodness out of the way, let's dive right into it. Section one, what can Konami do differently to benefit themselves whilst still providing an accessible game to their community? Honestly, it's a really simple change. Anything, it probably nets them a higher amount of people buying their product, increasing their cash flow, uh, and that would be to make staples, ultras and core sets, or supers and deck builder or reprint sets and have that card also take up a starlight or a collector's rare spot which would allow people that want to chase things in maximum over rarity whilst still making the staple cards accessible to the average person because they would be at a lower price point and they would be more accessible there would be more of them in the game everybody wins high rarity people they win because they're going to be able to go after it and find it in high rarity maximum over rarity as i like to call it and the average player who has a more limited budget is able to enter the game at a higher level, allowing more people to compete because these staple cards are more accessible. It allows new players better access to the game. With that, when your initial printing is done, you can hold off on reprinting it for six months instead of shotgunning a reprint in the first three to four months, you can hold off on it for six months because the set itself in sealed form will retain its value because the staples are accessible. And it also, if a strategy that you wanted to, for example, when Vanquish Soul came out, it was all in high rarity. That's fine. None of the staples were high rarity, except in the collector's rare spots. For example, Fire Formation Tenki, reinforcements to the army, those kinds of cards were accessible in high rarity and in low rarity, making it more accessible for the low end staples. And it made the high end cards like Vanquish Soul expensive because they were filling up the high end spots. That set will hold value because individual strategies or archetypes are being increased in rarity, making them more valuable. So your sealed product retains its value for longer periods of time making it a more sustainable business model for you and a more accessible game for all of us. Everybody wins and more players are able to join the game. Now moving on to section two. There are a few resources that I use. First, I play the locals every week. Hold on. <clears throat> when you play at an OTS store, even if it's not, find somewhere that offers prize support. Yeah, you're gonna pay five, seven, 10 bucks a week. Find somewhere to play. It's incredibly important. So, first and foremost, find the locals. That's what I have. I play the locals every single week. If you can play more than that, if you can afford more than that, great. If you can't afford more than once a week or once every other week, depending on your situation, you know, just find somewhere to play. Incredibly important. Because with prizing, 
It increases your card pool. And that's gonna be really important with later resources that we use. Second, a TCG player seller account. I have one. I use the option to take in store credit with TCG player. So I get to basically trade it. It's money that never hits my bank account. It's money I never spend in cards. It's only that allowing me to in invest in other things. Third, this is optional. You don't have to do this one. This one's completely up to you if you have this group of people that you trust. Get a team of people around you. I have a small group of friends that I trust. We collectively pool our card pool together. We sell things that we don't need and then we, we get things that we need for each other. Um, there's no, you know, you get this, I get, like it's just, we get it collectively and then, you know, whoever wanted it, we'll get it and it's just, it's a good give and take. I have it with, I have about four people in my, in my current team and we all pool resources together and it really does greatly help, uh, especially with the kickoff, but down the long term, as long as you're all honest with each other, it's super useful. And finally, a secondary way to move cards. For example, social media groups like Facebook or Discord, which you should be cautious with, or with the local community that you work with. For me, I have access to all of those, so it's great. Using your locals is a great training spot. So those are the resources that I have access to, and if you don't have access to one of them, whether if you don't have access to the locals, all the rest of these are really difficult um, because you're gonna be limited in what you can do. Everything's going to be a financial investment on your end. Whereas if you have the locals, that limits that down quite a bit. If you're missing part of it, that's okay. But these are the resources that I have and I use. So let's move on to the practices that we use along with those resources to give you the better understanding of how and what we do so that you can take it and use it to your full advantage. The best practices can be incredibly difficult. I understand that. I'm a very dedicated and militant individual, so it makes it real easy for me. But I understand that some of these can be difficult for people depending on where you're at. So here are the steps I used while, I, while myself and my team built up uh, the stream we needed through the game. First, limit yourself to one or two strategies you wanna play. It is not sustainable to try to build 55, 60 decks at a time. It is not sustainable to try to do more than two. Two is fine. If you have a control deck and a combo deck you really wanna play, cool. If you've got two control decks that you just have different play styles that you enjoy, cool. But limit yourself to one to two. Reason being is you're over investing in multiple different engines and you're not making money, you're just hoarding. And that's not gonna be sustainable for the long haul. That's sustainable for the now and it doesn't work. It, you will eventually be able to get there if you do things correctly and you make really good sound choices and you're dedicated, but right out of the gate, limit yourself. Everything else is completely expendable. You can get it back later. They're completely replaceable, I promise you. That's the first thing. Second, you set up your TCG player account or other seller account, depending on where you're at. So if, it, if you don't have TCG player, if you're in Europe or in Australia or wherever, set up your seller account and get your shipping preparations together. What I mean by that is you need envelopes. I recommend a number 10 with a window. Then you don't have to write anybody's address down. You can fold the letter and it even shows you how to fold it on the, on the paper when you print it. Fold it in half, fold it on the dotted line, write it. Number 10 with a window, super helpful. So you'll need envelopes, you'll need stamps. Stamps are incredibly important because you gotta be able to ship them. Um, you're going to need top loaders to keep your cards protected. I recommend at least having enough top loaders for the number of $5 or more cards that you have. So if you have $100, $5 or more cards, you wanna have 100 top loaders in case you sell one of those to 100 different people. You wanna have enough to cover what you need to and $5 or more is where you wanna make sure those cards are protected in a top loader. Or the cardboard things, whichever, whatever you have better access to, you wanna have those. And lastly, I recommend this. This is a big financial startup, kind of. You can get them for like 30 bucks as a printer. Having access to a printer is incredibly helpful as you will not have to spend anything more on your shipping costs other than buying envelopes when you need to. You can get a box of 100 envelopes for like seven bucks. Printer paper, which is like 10 bucks for a stack of like 500. Stamps, which are about $20 a roll, like a book, not even. It's less than that, they're about 55 cents a piece, I think right now. 
So you're looking at like $13 for a book of stamps, roughly depending on your area, but where I'm at, it's about 13 bucks. So let's say $20. And then the printer, 30 bucks. Ink, you'll have to replace ink. Depend, it depends on how strong your load is, but you'll be able to do a lot of orders pretty consistently. And a lot of printers can print your address and stuff on there. So you're not wasting time writing your address on stuff for the return address in case an order doesn't go through. That is the bulk of your startup cost is right there. If you already have a card pool, that's the bulk of the startup cost is getting access to all these things. Yeah, it's about $75 to get this started, right? It sounds scary, but you can start making that back in terms of the game. So yeah, $100 startup cost, let's call it. Third, this is a great way to jumpstart financing if you need help. Use the social media sites as a quick financing. You could set up a PayPal, that's how I do it. I don't use PayPal for anything other than buying cards so that when I sell cards to individuals, I have them PayPal me the money. Here's some best practices when it comes to this style of trading and selling. With the social medias, one, if you're selling it, do not sell it at less than 85% of whatever the market standard is with you. For me, it's TCG player. So the market standard, whatever, 80, whatever it says, I don't sell it for less than 85%. Here's why. I will make 85% of what I spend, on, sell it for on TCG player anyway. There are caveats you can use to do that different, but don't sell it for less than 85% unless they're buying a lot of cards, 85% is fair. They, You're not paying the 15%, the 14.5% that you lose from TCG Player right off the gate. They don't pay shipping, they're paying for the card just without shipping. It's a win-win. They get it for 85% of cost, you get the full value, and you have it right there to start with, right? So if it's a $100 card, you can sell it for 85. Don't go lower than that unless they're buying a larger collection of cards then it's worth it to move it at 80% because you're not upfronting the cost for the, for the shipping, which is incredibly important. If you're trading, let's say you have a $100 card and they have $80 worth of cards they're trying to trade to you, they need to cover the difference. Reason being is a trade should be equal. Both parties should be equal. And you, if you're trying to build a healthy collection, you can make exceptions if it's like something you really need for a deck. That's Fine, you can make those exceptions when you need to, but in general, you wanna make sure that your trading is even, because if you're not, you're losing money on a card you could sell and then just buy them anyway. It's a waste of time. So you wanna make sure that when you're doing trades, it's 100% even. When you're selling stuff to people you meet off, offline or through Discord, you don't go lower than 85%, unless they're buying a large quantity of cards. That is a different story. Dropping it to 80%, you're saving money on the back end because it's gonna cost you more in shipping because larger stacks cost more in stamps. You've gotta you got know your trade-offs. That's kind of like uh, an example of how you can bring those costs down. And this will jumpstart all of it, making sure you have your collection put together and organized. Now that you've done your big jumpstart, your TCG player is set up, you have all your shipping materials, you paid for them by selling some of your collection that you were gonna sell anyway, or you already had the upfront costs now you build up your TCG player account. So you're gonna start as a level one seller. You're only allowed to sell 100 cards on there. You have limits on what you can and can't do as a level one, a level two, a level three, and a level four seller. Level four sellers are kind of like the, the floodgates are broken wide open. But for level one, you have to make a few sales first. You have to make these things happen. Start by building it up slowly and over time. Like I said, it caught, you lose about 14.5%. So if it's a $100 card, you're only looking at 85 and a half. There's also taxes and shipping fees, so make sure you just do those things. But I recommend stay competitive with your prices and update the prices all the time. With those things, if you keep it all controlled and limited, you're gonna be able to see a lot of growth and you can see it pretty quickly depending on what you have that you don't need. That's the other part of this. Yeah, are you going to invest all of your cards into this? I do. I highly recommend you do it. The things you don't sell are staples. But if you've got a deck core that you're not playing, sell it. Be honest with yourself, are you going to play it? These tools and resources are things that I still use today. I haven't spent money on this game in three years. What I've spent is time and energy, and the only investment I make, really, is buying stamps and envelopes, which are things I use anyway for other things that I'm doing. And this model can be used in other card games. Well, specifically Magic and Pokemon, I don't know about the other card games. I don't know their markets.
but I've seen and worked with the Magic and Pokemon communities before. Just limit what you're doing. Be smart. Don't be afraid to sell something. You'll be able to buy it back. I have sold things, bought them back, and sold them again, and that was in a three month period. You'll do it. You'll make mistakes. You'll realize you want to try something. It doesn't work. You sell it. You offload it. It is what it is. Don't be afraid to sell things. Don't be afraid to buy things. You can't let that be your hang up once you're in the form where you're making money from this, where this is just a give and take. But this is an incredibly great time to get into it because if you have a collection, you could start by offloading it. The things that, especially the things you don't need, so that you can build up the things you do want so that you can play the game how you wish to at whatever level you want to and it's completely sustainable. You can ask anybody that's on my team, Lucas, Chris, Duke, Travis, they're all a part of it and they all know. Like they just hand me stuff and I deal with selling it. It really is that easy. So find somebody you trust, find a group of people you trust, pool your resources and you'll all be able to play whatever competitive level you want all you have to do is be dedicated and, and structured in what you're doing. And I have full faith that this resource is going to help you go from Yu-Gi-Oh! Brokey to Yu-Gi-Oh! Pro. That is a joke. Don't take that seriously. It's just me messing around with you guys. It's fine. We're good, right? Yeah, see? Don't come after me. We're just having fun. I look forward to seeing you guys soon. We're going to get back to regular Yu-Gi-Oh! content now. Uh, this is me addressing the drama, the drama. Am I in a very privileged position? Kind of. But like, I put myself there through hard work and now I'm telling you everything I've done so that you too can find a way to make it work for you at whatever level you want. I have full faith in you, I believe in you. And until next time, lads, you, good fun. Have luck.